Welcome back. Thank you once again for hanging out with us. This is the one and only IT in the D show. I'm your host, Bob Waltenspiel, hanging out with producer, co-host extraordinaire, Randy Walker. Guest this week, John Bingham. He is the COO of Speak by Design, former CISO of three of the biggest companies in Michigan. We're going to talk about his transition to consulting and life as a CISO. You can find us online, IT in the D. Dot com. Do us a favor. Give us a like on the socials. Subscribe to us everywhere. Fine podcasts are sold. Don't forget, check us out. Meetup.com slash IT and the D. Our networking events every third Thursday, uh, five o'clock until question mark. We're going to be at Eastern Palace Club in Hazel Park for some uh, good times. Don't have to bring. Uh, go ahead. That is tonight when this episode drops. It's so. tonight. Um, hope to see you out. If not, uh, sign up on Meetup and they'll uh, send you notifications or you can. You know, but yeah, no, uh, no speakers, no cover charge, just a bunch of IT folks talking shop. Good times. Speaking of good times, John, how are they treating you? Great, great. Happy to be here and uh, excited just to talk about technology and kind of what I've been up to these days. So I need to tell the story on how we met because I think it's hilarious. I already told the story once to Randy, but I'll tell it again. Uh, John and I, our daughters play soccer together. And it was always just cordial formality. Hey, good morning. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And we no, no one ever talked about work. And <laughs> John, we happened to do the, the what do you do one day. And uh, I said, I worked for this uh, security software company. And I said, you're not going to know what it is. And John's like, I know exactly what it is. I'm like, what, what the hell do you do? He's like, I'm the CISO at this auto company. And I'm like, oh, well, no shit. <laughs> we should be friends. Um, I think that's that we got we, along so well was that we hadn't been talking about work before. That. Right, exactly. Exactly. But now, uh, yeah, we just ran into you at breakfast, so I invited you on the show. It's really uh, good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. So we'll st- we'll start from, uh, I was going to start origin story because I was a comic book guy. I was like uh, origin stuff. But I like I like the today part because you're living, uh, I think every practitioner's and or salesperson's dream is that you got to transition into consulting. Um, how did, like, when was the day that you were just like, you know what, I'm, uh, you know, I this is, this is too good. I have, or, or at least I have a good opportunity, um, in this whole, you know, being a CISO and being, (laughs) being up 24 hours a day is just for the birds. And, uh, you know, I guess what was that epiphany that brought you into consulting? So, so I will say my, um, my current boss is very persuasive and, uh, we were talking one morning over breakfast. So I, I work with my wife, uh, basically in a business that she started 20 years ago. And for many years, I'll say I worked on the business helping her, you know, think through business problems, how are we going to scale this? But then I would go off and work in my large corporate environment. And, uh, you know, we talk about my problems, we talk about her problems. And then over time, she grew the business to her credit big enough that it was something that we really started looking at. And she had been pushing me for a couple of years to say, let's work together. Let's do this together. And, um, you know, I had talked to enough people that the cautionary tale of working with your spouse was definitely top of mind to me. And, uh, you know, we both kind of talked through it. We set some ground rules and decided how we were going to make this work. And, uh, and really, so four years into this, it's been great. I, I get to focus on something that I think when I was a practitioner, I was pretty good at. Um, I used to describe my, my role as a CISO. I would say I was kind of like the chief storyteller and fundraiser. I was my job to basically get out there and, and help sell the ideas of my talented teams and just make sure that there was, you know, almost like, you know, throwing track in front of the train. How do we, uh, how do we keep these guys going? And now that's, that's really what speak by design does. We, we work with, you know, successful executives that are trying to get to that next level and maybe what's holding them back is their ability to consistently drive change. And that's so you're saying that CISOs are sales guys. You just, uh, I think you just broke the internet with that one. <laughs> I've been I'm, fighting for years on that one. They, I believe they absolutely are. And, and if they're not selling, then they're, they're not sitting in the right chair at the table. I, uh, I wrote a blog a long time ago going, everyone's in sales. Even you, Mr. IT nerd that despises me with all their, with all of their being. Um, yeah, I think you got to sell. yeah, even if you're doing a project at work, you got to sell your boss, you got to sell your team, you got to work together. It's, it's, a, you know, there's, there's an art to it. Um, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I, you know, Bob, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I learned actually through a couple of mistakes myself as a young CISO, um, I'd get all enamored with the technology. I would get excited. 
I would start trying to sell it to my own team. And I realized that if I didn't partner with the salesperson to say, look, I need someone on my team to be selling this back to me, I was actually setting myself and the salesperson up for failure. Because as a CISO, I didn't have the bandwidth to run the projects. Sure. Right? I needed someone on my team that would love this technology. And sometimes that salesperson would look at me and be like, oh, John, you're just pushing me off on someone. I'd say, no, I'm not going anywhere. I just, I need this person to own this project and they need to be selling it as well. Sure. So I'm dying to know what these ground rules are with you and your wife, because if I ever worked with my wife, she would murder me in about yeah. three weeks, three hours, three minutes. Um, do, can you share these publicly or is this, uh, or is this kept under the house? Yeah, no, we, we, I mean, a couple of things we, we, um, we now have scheduled dates. We don't talk about work while we're out. I know that sounds kind of cheesy. We've got a, we've got a Broadway in Detroit, uh, subscription that we're fans of. Cause that just kind of schedules in those date nights. Um, we actually do write down our to-do lists because if the two of us just start talking about things, it just gets too easy to, to forget and, you know, kind of reprioritize and, um, uh, we, we actually have a coach ourselves. So we, we've engaged with someone and sometimes that person is a, uh, is a mediator. Uh, I would say Stephanie tends to play the role of more of the visionary for our organization. And then I tend to play more of what they call an integrator role. So, so she'll set out these lofty goals and, and left on her own, she will do those things as well, but it's honestly not the best use of her time, right? Better use of her time is getting out in front of clients, um, I will jokingly say, you know, I have a face for back office. So I'm the one that yeah. I put together contracts and work on scheduling. And I work with someone that takes care of all of our billing. Stephanie takes care of, you know, selling those ideas to our clients. Um, sure, sure. She's been doing it for 20 years and she's great at it. So what you're saying is you got to send her an Outlook invite to have dinner with her. <laughs> we, we, we schedule our life through Outlook. You're Although, using Microsoft to do for who's at, cooking. Right, who's at, doing the we schedule it through <laughs> Gmail, but. Um, right. And having three kids and for anyone else out there that has kids, you know, I mean, you live by that and your, your sports management apps. So whatever has a calendar integration that kind of drives our day to day team snap. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, I thought I was done with the the kids soccer, but nope, here comes Annie tell 10 years old. She's uh, yes, in the travel that. soccer thing. So yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, uh, we're all in You're growing um, a goalkeeper. Yes, yeah, she is a goalie. Yeah. yeah. I know for third, uh, and then, uh, yeah, Maggie's a senior, you know, in Avondale. So she, that's, uh, that's their, this her last soccer, uh, year. So I gotta, I gotta, this has been a long ride. It flies, flies by. Right? It does. It does. So speak by design. This is, um, this is one of the, you know, I always like talking to CISOs. We just had about Eric Willie on a couple of weeks ago okay. and uh, I always get into the weeds, but what you're doing with speak by design, this hits me, this hits my passion. Cause I've always, uh, I've never wanted to do stand up comedy, but I've always enjoyed being doing public speaking. I've always enjoyed being in front of a room. I've always enjoyed storytelling, even if it's at the end of a bar stool or in a boardroom. Like, I, that's a huge passion of mine. Mm -hmm. How do you, I guess, you know, obviously, you got to take people's superpowers for what they are because some people are good at certain level of speaking or, or communicating. Some people aren't. You, I guess, how do you find out who they are first before you teach them best practices next? Sure. So, so we start off with a, a pretty standard diagnostic with most of our clients. Um, simple things like um, a couple of stories we ask them to tell us. Just give me your self-introduction. Something that everybody should be able to do. Then sure. after that, we ask them, introduce your company to me or your business unit, whatever kind of makes sense. Um, tell us a success story. Tell us a war story. And then help us paint a picture of the future. And then through taking them through those five stories and we record it, they can play it back. They can watch it. We give them feedback. Um, one of the things we do that we believe, and it sounds to me very simple from my consulting days, but kind of brought this forward. We give them written feedback after our sessions, which we want them in the moment while they're talking with us and not feeling like, oh, that's a great idea. Let me write that down or let me put down that URL so I can go watch that YouTube video or something. Right. Um, we send them all that in writing afterwards. But, but once we get them talking about themselves, about things that they're passionate about, then we start to figure out, okay, well, you know, what do we walk you through? And, and we tend to have three areas of focus. We call it style, structure, and strategy. And there's a whole bunch of modules underneath that that we can cover. But um, 
you know, it's, it's basically, you know, not, it's not, it's certainly not a one size fits all type thing. And we believe that's, that's where we differentiate ourselves from a lot of like the large vendors that are sure. communications coaches that, um, you know, they sit there with a clicker every time you say, um, <laughs> okay, that may matter with certain audiences, but going sure. back to, you know, something you and I have talked about before, there's that art of storytelling. There's, there's understanding how do you motivate the person that you're talking to? There's a lot of psychology to it beyond just the mechanics. There was a big thing in podcasting for a minute, you know, cause we were, when we just jumped into this, we didn't know what we were doing and we didn't follow any formula or program for podcasting. A bunch of people were like, we edit our show down we cut out our ums and ahs. And we had a big philosophy going, I don't want to cut that out because this, if you meet me <laughs> at the bar, mm -hmm. this is how I'm going to speak. So why wouldn't I want this to be very natural? I don't want to be an unnatural version of myself. Yeah. Uh, even in the, even in the boardroom, I want, this to be the conversation we have at the coffee house is the same as in the boardroom. And some people I think don't either don't see that or don't do that. They get, they get excited, worked up. Like I want, I want to talk to you about presentations because this was a big thing, you know, sales guy for almost 25 years now, I got it. You know, I, I've learned from a lot of different people and I've kind of developed my own system, but mine is, you know, it's a five slide deck minimum, you know, intros, you know, agenda, this and that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, here's the three things I'm going to talk about. Here's the three things. Here's, a, here's the three things that, that we talked about mm -hmm. and, and, and here's what's next. Yeah. Um, you know, it being in the consulting world and you grew up in it too. It's like, you, you get these slides, man, it, where it's like, you need a magnifying glass and a telescope. And there's like, the, you, it's just so hard to tell a story. I, what, I guess, what's your best practices on, on e e presenting or, you know, getting a point across in a, in a boardroom. You know, a lot of it. And I, I as you were saying that, and I was thinking about something I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm trying to find a better word, but um, authenticity is an overused word. I feel sometimes, but I'm, I don't have a better one right now. Um, it, it's trying to help people understand how to convey themselves sincerely as they're presenting. And, and I feel like sometimes people come to us and it feels like they're asking just for techniques and, and you can do some technique work, but honestly, that is, that's very tactical. It, it doesn't really get people to more of the strategic side of things of how do we build relationships? And, and we talk about, we help our clients become consistently compelling forces is kind of a buzzword that, that we use. And we think that's applicable if you're, if you're in sales, if you're in leadership, um, if you're, you know, if you're a project manager, right? How, how do you drive the folks around you? through a change. Um, a common client of ours is someone who's taking over a new leadership role. So they've been in uh, small team management. Now they're leading up a larger function. So now they're going to start speaking at town halls, or maybe they're a CISO that has been on the ops side. And now they're actually going in and they are speaking to the executive committee or they're speaking to the board. And, you know, we, we look at it and we say, okay, so first and foremost, what's your authentic voice? How, how do you talk about these things? Um, I know Bobby and I have talked about before, like what works for me in terms of a, a relationship with someone from a sales standpoint. I want to make sure the person has a lasting investment in what they're selling me. And it's not just in this transaction and they're going to be gone. When you go into a boardroom, when you go to an executive committee, um, a lot of your peers, they know the stats that CISOs are two years and done, three years and done. So what they want to get over is how long are you going to be here as well? Because a lot of times the rest of those people around the table, they've had some pretty long tenures. They're not moving quickly either. So if they're going to commit to a strategy with you, they want to know you're going to be around to deliver it as well. So, you, so we start with that from a messaging standpoint and, and, and then, you know, we, we can talk about all the, um, you know, I, I totally agree with your point about the, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell it to you. And then I'm going to remind you what I told you. That way I'm not, you know, going off down all these different rabbit holes. Sure. Sure. It's funny you mentioned that because, uh, it brought up, there's someone that we know that's a, a C-level executive at a very big company in town and people, there's like 10 people that have come out of the woodwork. That's like, so-and-so's leaving. How do you know? his LinkedIn <laughs> and we're mm -hmm. like, it's, it's crazy how the dead giveaway 
that like people really need to be cognizant on their interactions that, you know, to remain, if they don't want to tip their hat that they're leaving, whether, whether they're, where they're at, um, All of a sudden they're, they're freshening up their experience. And, yeah. Yeah. Connecting so people. one of the things you talked about earlier, and I'm, I want to get your, your thoughts on this is, uh, you know, tell me about your company or tell me about yourself, because this is another thing that was, I'm super passionate about, um, is the elevator pitch and Hewlett Packard trained me, uh, for an entire day on my 60 second elevator pitch. And I walked out of that meeting and I told the trainer, I will never in my entire life say this to another human being. And they looked at me and they're like, why? And I said, I don't know who, the, what, the, who they are and if this means anything to them. And so then I took it and I said, I'm going to create the 60 second elevator pitch and it's going to be 15, three second pitches and it's going to be interactive and we're going to talk. And because let, let's say you're a, you're a CISO, you might get my lingo. If you're the CFO, you have no effing clue what I'm saying to you. So I'm stopping and I'm let, then I'm going to ask you questions or let you talk. Um, so I'm, I'm like, yeah. when people come up, like, you know, or, or if you just come at me and bark features benefits, cause I've had people at our meetups like, I'll never, this guy will live in infamy, but he just walks up to me. He's like, oh man, Hey, we got this agentless browser. Blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, dude. Like, who, who do you think I am like that? I would understand what you're talking about. And, and um, usually that person will, if they're sitting saying that to a CISO, they'll say, are you talking with your board about agentless browsers? <laughs> and you're like, well, that would be the last conversation I would ever have with my board because I wouldn't be allowed back in. And, and, um, so, so we run a, a one methodology that we teach people and we call it um, 360 degree communication agility. And, and I wish I knew this earlier in my career because ways I stubbed my toe as a early CISO was feeling like every room I was in, people were looking at me to be the expert in something. And I think a lot of CISOs get treated this way. And, and sometimes on my bad days, I'll call it stump the chump or, you know, they're kind of setting you up to fail because Absolutely. a lot of CISOs just get backed into a corner and feel like, um, so I helped, uh, in the early days of, um, Google workplace adoption, I helped a large company adopt Google workplace where most large companies were looking at that and saying, that's Google. No way. They won't tell us how it works. We can't get a third party attestation. There's no way we're going to deal with that. And the C the CIO came to me and he said, John, this is a strategic priority for the company. Here's why we need to do it. I need your support. Do it ever you need to do to figure out how to get comfortable with this. So I packed up the team. We went out to Mountain View. We were out there for a couple of weeks. We figured some stuff out. But a lot of times the CISO gets backed into a corner and is just told, well, make a decision. And, and what we talk about in this 360 degree communication agility is that is one role that sometimes you play. But maybe your role is the consultant. Maybe your role is just a guide. So, so sometimes there are decisions that are not yours to make, but you're there to inform people. And, and part of what we are trying to teach people as well is how do you just listen? So, you know, if you came to me and, and, you know, well, John, you need agentless browsers. <laughs> well, that's interesting. What, what risk am I trying to solve? What are we trying to do? So, so, you know, if you push back on the conversation a little bit and ask some probing questions, then maybe I can then speak more knowledgeably to hit some points. And, and um, when I was in consulting, I went through a sales class that had talked about years of dysfunctional selling have created dysfunctional buying. Mm -hmm. so the guy walks into the room. He says, you need agentless browsing. I'm like, you have no idea even what my name is. What, what are you talking about? This guy didn't know my name. Yeah, he never has. And our conversation is done. Like you're now digging your way out of a hole. Now we're mocking him on a podcast, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it all day long. I wish I'd remember his name because I'd call him out publicly. And I'm sure um, there's a lot of great business cases for that. So we shouldn't, but yeah. Right, right, right. Um, no, but getting back into at least like the, the, the elevator pitch. And that's the one thing I think people forgot about. And my philosophy on at least in sales and in that is, you know, build a relationship, find a problem, be business relevant, mm -hmm. pitch the product. And, and in that order, like that product should be the F the last thing that you ever talk about. Cause it doesn't need, cause it doesn't. And especially if it's not, if it's not important to them. Yeah. Um, again, like I, my, 
the reason why reason why I'm loving this conversation or is your shift. My shift is to um, I need to retrain salespeople. Like I think it's there's people out there, especially in the in the OEM space, the software sales, the hardware sales, that they don't get it. Like they're so caught up in their product and their features and benefits that they're, they're, they're failing to see the world around them. There's still some, there's some good people in town. Um, but like in the, in the, in that vendor space, it's just, it's bad. Like, how did you, I guess, did you coach any of them or did you just like blow them off? Cause I mean, we've talked a hundred times, like how many phone calls you got in a day. It was like hundred a day. It was like, it's like a girl on uh, match.com. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. They, they were looking for something else, but I, uh, yeah, I mean that that's that's one of the biggest challenges from a CISO perspective. I I have um I, actually I'll I'll share I mean even by name, right? So that when I met you at breakfast, I was out with Rick Lane, who yeah, yeah. we've had a great friendship. And and Rick and I go way back to he was cold calling me over and over again, and I had no time because I I didn't understand his solution. He didn't understand my problem. And then we had a mutual friend who had worked with Rick who said this solution is the real deal. This person can help you. Now all of a sudden it's interesting. And, and what was great and what helped that relationship grow was he was respectful of my time frame, knowing that if something goes wrong, I own this because I'm the one that's on the inside of the company. And the reality is I've got company processes I've got to work through to get this. I, I told him with the original purchase. And I think back now, and it's just from, brings me back to my corporate days. I said, Rick, it's going to take me 13 months to justify this. And he's like, what? But I, but I told him, I was like, this is a green field spot in my budget. And right now I'm, I was fairly new in my role. My leadership team doesn't understand what this risk is. So, so I can't just go in and start banging my fist on the desk and say, you know, I need to talk to the board about this risk, even though in the security world, I knew it was a big deal, but you have to build that trust to, to your point. So I was, I was selling internal to the company and I am proud to say we made that purchase 14 months from the time that Rick and I met. So I was a little bit behind, Spot on. but, but I knew my budget cycle and, you know, had to work through that and had to build my allies so I could sell the project. It was messing with email. And, and one of the things that unfortunately is the lifeblood blood of many corporate processes is email. And, sure. and if you get in the way of that, um, if you're the last one who touched it, now there's an outage, it all comes down on you. So sure. It took me a little while to get there. But, but to your point about building those relationships, that is, that's foundational. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's the thing, like, you, you know, you have timelines, you know, we have quotas and it's like, you should never have to know about my quota or my, it's end of month or my, <laughs> you know, I think that's bastardized. The entire industry is, you know, Cisco always did buy in July and it was like, everybody knew you'd get a massive discount from EMC and Cisco. If you just waited till the last day of their fiscal and it's, it's unfortunate. It shouldn't be like that. I, I used to always feel like one of the most respectful things on the other side was to say no to things. Thank you. And what you want on the other side, right? Is that respectful? Okay, John, I know that's sincere and it's not no, never. It's just right now. This isn't yeah. the thing I need to solve. I wrote a blog. It's funny that we keep talking about this, but I wrote a blog called please for the love of God, just say no. <laughs> like, don't let me, you know, because yeah, we'll, we'll probably still be friends after this, but like, God, you know, I, I have to, you know, like the, our processes, we have to tell our, our bosses and it's got to go in Salesforce. And then at every Monday morning, I'm like, well, what's going on with John? And we're like, well, he won't return my calls. And like, well, that you're a shitty salesperson, you know? Um, and then, then a lot of times what would happen is you'd tell your boss and I'm not saying you and I had done this, but someone else. And then now I'm getting a call from the boss. And it's like, oh God, what do we got to do? Thanks for calling. And, you know, when I was at a the finish line, <laughs> I was at a large manufacturing uh, appliance manufacturing company on the other side of the state. And I loved it. My time there, beautiful little beachside community. The reality is no salesperson was coming there unless they wanted to go to the beach or to visit me. So when, <laughs> so when someone would come through and they, Oh, John, I'm going to be in the area. Yeah. I'm like, really? Like, don't put that on you. Don't put that on me. Like, right, right. I'm not that guy. You don't have to come to the office. Give me a call. It's actually way more efficient for both of us. Um, you know, I, I know the world's gotten a lot harder for people in sales roles post COVID because that office location sometimes can be harder to pin people down. And Absolutely. We, we actually did a lot of work with sales teams early in COVID helping 
great salespeople that could carry on great conversations in person, pivot and figure out how do I start doing this virtually? I have a hard time because I am the right now I've booked, I'm more breakfast, lunch, happy hours than I've ever, I'm doing three o'clock coffees now. Like that's how much like that's I need crazy. to be. I, that's how much I'm not good on teams and how good I am in person. And I know this. Yeah. If I'm going to get anything done, we're going to sit down. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and it's this is you know, is everyone does the disc profile thing, and mm-hmm. the the interesting thing when you when you're talking with people because I'm getting into the kind of the corporate communication side, um, is that you know I'm a high eye right? I'd rather talk about baseball for 45 minutes. And oh, by the way, let's get business done really quick by the end of the meeting. And then we'll, you know, um, but there's certain people that want, you know, 10 minutes and get out of my life. Yeah. Tell me what I need to know. You know, the, the drivers, the high D's, then you have like the analytics that want the numbers breakdown. They want to know the math. You have some people that like all of it, like me personally. Um, like I love the analytics side of it, you know, but I also want to talk about fishing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I, for some reason, either I learned it or I was born with it or whatever, but I have an uncanny ability to, to figure out like where I'm at and it's eyes and it's, you know, looking at your Apple watch and it's, 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 a, it's leaning in. It's, it's mm-hmm. the eyes are opening bigger. There's a lot of like things like, I don't understand that whole psychology thing with like the arm folding and all. I'm not like at that level. Yeah. You know, you see that crap on TV, but like figuring out, oh, okay, all right, my time's done. Let me, let me get to it and I'll get out of here. Um, Do you, I guess, have you figured out that, how to deal with that or like, cause you can't walk into a driver and sit there and want to talk about the tigers or the NFL draft or something. They're going to look at you right. like you're a crackhead and throw you out and never talk to you again. Yeah. Do you have any formulaic way of like kind of going, all right, where am I at in this? You know, is it an ask beforehand? Is it a figuring it out on the fly? Like what's, what's a, what's a good methodology? Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe this is a little bit too, too perfect world, right? But it's, some of it is prep work for the meeting, which you don't always have the luxury of doing. But if, if most of the time when I would take a meeting from someone, it was a referral. So I'm thinking about when I was on the buyer side and, and getting to that point, I would hope that the person that was trying to say sell into me was asking, well, what's John like? What, what, you know, how's this uh, meeting going to play out? Right. So, so you're doing that once you get into the room. So now I'm thinking, how would we coach people on that? Um, yeah, there, there is a lot of visual cues. Probably some of it is just looking around the person's office and have they surrounded themselves with a bunch of personal things or, uh, you know, is it a very stark office? I, I had a boss who used to say he followed the one box rule, right? The day he gets fired and walked out of there, all his stuff goes into one box so he can get out of there. Um, right. and, you know, so, so that's one thing that we would, we would coach people to do is look around and just see how much of, how many clues is the person giving away just in their space? You know, we're on video here, right? And I'm looking in the yeah, background yeah. behind you. And, and I think that's even applicable when you're on Zoom with someone. Do they have a fake background? Do they, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. how much are they trying or, or are they just trying to be, uh, you know, for me, as you see, like I'm, I'm here in my house. You're seeing it. And, and we tend to encourage people to do that unless there's something that they, you know, they want to really de-emphasize that. So there's a browser plugin called Crystal. Um, I talked about this, I think, with Eric last time he was on. And it tells me how to talk to you. Um, really? So I, I pulled you up. Yeah, it says you're a, you're a driver. You're a, high, you're a driver D small i. Um, okay. On the desk. It says, use an energetic, assertive tone, highlight competitive advantage of your products. Don't be overly friendly. Be assertive and push back. Don't sugarcoat or use vague language. Mm. So now it's like, it's best to, so now it's telling me, you know, I need to call John so I can make a sales pitch and it's telling me how to talk to you. Um, this is, is it doing that based on words I'm saying or doing it? It's on- based on your LinkedIn profile. I don't know if it's getting, cause I thought for me, it was getting into, cause it's on Google. It's getting into my Gmail. It sees how I talk. Um, because it knew, like it said to me, like, you know, take them out to lunch or like drink or something like, you know, he's <laughs> social, like don't, yeah. don't pitch him shit <laughs> type of language. It, with me, it was like, it was scary. Um, huh. 
I mean, yeah. if you were saying that some of those things, I was like, yes, I do like that. Some of it, I was like, mm. but yeah, when you understand the data set, right. What, what gets fed in there. Well, um, and that's, you know, we, uh, I think we're on 12 AI episodes in a row. So like, that's another thing It's like the data set. Yeah. To work I want to talk to you about that because the, that's the biggest problem right now is, and I, I don't know if you're still in the life, but like securing the data set, that's a big problem I mean, with like Copilot getting l- delivered for every application. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a certain, we were talking about a project today that everyone got to see everything, privileged data, everything got flattened out and wow. it was, it was a wow moment. So now like, it's a very big deal now is backtracking and making sure, um, you know, there's, there's so many applications now, the use cases for AI are, uh, are insane. And, yeah. and like the security side is like either they're not focused. I don't want to say they're not focusing on it. It's the number, it's the number one and two thing, data quality and security. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. If you're not looking at those two things, How, but I mean, training the models and, uh, some of this, you know, you and I've talked before too about like, um, do paradigms just refresh themselves maybe with, with some new terms? I mean, AI of course is, you know, groundbreaking and moving forward. I think of things like moving from structured data to unstructured data and just the fits that that created for information security teams, um, moving from in your data center behind your firewall to now it's someone else's data center. We're accessing it through APIs and, and different protocols and, um, you know, so so much of that comes down to um, not necessarily distributing the accountability to people, because then you can very quickly get to, to no accountability. But how do you how do you educate the people that are doing business processes to start thinking with a bit of a risk lens? Absolutely, it's a thing. Um, oh, here's more. Here's more. I'm not, I'm just squirreling around a little bit, but. Um, <laughs> You have a one track mind and you want things to move quickly, be direct and concise and avoid unnecessary information and tying it back to their goals. Um, project confidence. Don't be thrown off by a blunt comment. <laughs> this is hilarious. You are independent and strong willed. They may appreciate the direct conversation and lively debate. Be a, uh, Avoid being offended by pushbacks. That's two now blunt comments and pushback. <laughs> Can you just imagine like, let's take this out of the business context and throw this into like dating or something. Right. I'm thinking oh, my, yeah. my, my son got me uh, as a Christmas present this year. He got me those Ray-Ban, um, the talking glasses. Oh yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Which, which I kind of like them cause they're, they're a normal set of sunglasses. I can take, uh, you know, simple basic pictures with it, but I mostly am using it just like as I'm walking around, listening to podcasts or, you know, mm-hmm. it's an alternative to my AirPods. But, but thinking about so many of these things that will eventually become augmented reality. And, and yeah, you're, yeah. you're sitting there in a business meeting, you've, you have your regular glasses on and it's feeding you, you know, you're losing them. You're losing them. Oh. Like, like that's extra stress that you actually need. John, did you see the, um, the guy was filming his buddy in their apartment and the guy was interviewing with Accenture. And I don't know if this was set up or if it was bullshit or if it was real or not, because hmm. obviously it was on the internet. So, you know, <laughs> um, but the guy's asking him questions like, Hey, he was, he was interviewing for a dev position. He was asking him dev questions. Like, how would you attack this project? And the thing was listening to him and it was basically in real time scripting out the answers. And he was like, well, I would first, and he was reading it verbatim and it was, it was super cringy. And like, I hope it was a setup and wasn't real, but it like, again, it changes. Cause he's looking like we're looking like this, mm-hmm. you know, that's the problem when you have yeah. sometimes when your you're eyes are doing right there calls. and yeah, he sees like, you know, granted I got double screens in front of me. So my eyes might wander, but for the most part, his was like side by side. So he had a half screen, half screen on us on a single mm-hmm. and just completely like bullshitting the interviewer and, and reading all these answers out. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about fake it till you make it, but I mean, that takes it to another level. Yeah. I mean, simple little things, right? My, my kids are, they're juniors in high school. So I have twins that are you know taking the SATs and, you know, when, when I was taking it, there was no calculate, no calculators and, you know, teachers were anti-calculators because you're not going to have one of those all the time. And it's kind of trivial now to say that, well, no, we carried around who does math anymore, right? No, you just, nobody. Hey, hey Siri, what's this? Or, Hey, you know, 
As my daughter's almost get, getting kicked out of MSU for math class being the woods, but like every parent like complains online about MSU math. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Cause no, who's do, who does math? You know, it's nuts. Um, yeah. I, I have a friend, but now I have, but now I have an app that I can guess the marbles in the jar. So I can't wait until a coffee shop has that. So I can take, <laughs> so, yeah. but Hey, we're going to, we're going to let you go. John Bingham, um, speak by design.com. We're going to put all your stuff in the show notes, but, uh, really appreciate the conversation. This stuff's enlightening and I'm, I get fired up when I talk about stuff that, uh, it's near and dear to my heart. So I pre, I definitely appreciate the, uh, the candor and the, uh, and the conversation. This has been great. Thanks, Bob. Really enjoy the conversation. Awesome. Yeah. Appreciate the time. Hey, we're going to wrap things up on behalf of Bob and Randy. Do us all a favor, drink up your drinks, get your phone numbers. So you don't got to go home. You just got to get the hell out of here. See you next week. Drive careful. Beat it.